Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Hacking Visual Studio. I'm Matt Christensen, and uh, with us, at always, as always, we got the uh, multi-talented and always in a good mood, Mr. James. Hello, James. How's it going, buddy? Good to see you. I'm so excited to be here. I oh, love every minute that I get to spend with you. And I did get a new overlay, not a transition for today. We'll get to it later when Ooh. I may have a question for you. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be great. Glad to uh, to see that you're doing well. And, uh, you know, I think today's topic is kind of cool. It's it's uh, it's one of my favorite things about Visual Studio, extensibility we're going to look at. And I think it's one of those things that a lot of people use without even thinking about how it works. It has to do with single file generators. That's sort of the extensibility name of it. But you might have heard that as a custom tool. So a custom tool. Uh, is something we can associate with files in our projects, right? And um, we're going to take a look at that today. But before we get started, let's get to the news. All right. So we got some uh, some new blog posts. Let's uh, take a look at the screen here. So uh, Dimitri, um, who is, uh, he's the PM. He's the owner of the, the Hot Reload Hotness. And it is. It's super hot. So he wrote a blog post that where he goes through and highlights all the different things coming uh, already delivered in the previews of Visual Studio 2022. But then he goes further and talks about what's coming for the for the uh, GA and you know what's coming after that. And uh, if you're into all that stuff, you know, um, .NET development, and of course this is C++ as well. Uh, go check out this this particular blog post focuses on the .NET scenarios. Uh, but it's really, really cool. And a lot of comments. This one got a lot of comments. So those are always fun to uh, read. And the other one is on the Visual Studio blog. And this is Emily. She's um, uh, a director on our, um, uh, what's it called? The UX team, the, <laughs> the design team in developer division. And uh, one of her things is, of course, uh, Visual Studio, which is our big app, right? Um, and she goes through and chronicles basically how... They came up with the new logo, the new icons, and like you, you get to understand sort of the issues that the old icons had. And then um, she explains like what are the concerns when you create new icons and what are the process? What about accessibility, readability, uh, familiarity? There's all these different kind of things that go into it, clarity, all this sort of stuff. And so that's super interesting to look at and uh, and read this. And of course, she talks about the new dark theme as well. And um, yeah, a fantastic read. A lot of comments. Uh, I just love reading these comments. I think it's always fun to see what's uh, what people have to say about things. Um, but go check those two things out. They're kind of awesome. Uh, all right, that was the news. <laughs> James, I love those little, uh, what are they called? Bumpers? I don't know. Yeah, we'll call them bumpers. I think bumper is good. Yeah. The bumper good? Okay. We don't know what to call them, so we call them bumpers. Is that what you... Well, yeah. usually bumpers go mm -hmm. at the ends because they, they're the bumpers in between videos, right? Oh. Um, I think. But I, I don't know what these are called. I'm not in the... If anyone is in the in the news, mm -hmm. transitions... Uh, Laka says maybe transitions. Transitions. Yeah, oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah, but they're kind of, you know, they're like little uh, jingles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like them. I really like them. Thank you. And for I really me. like you. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Okay, so uh, there is a repo online called uh, the V6 Community Sample Repo. That's what we're looking at right here. So this is um, if you're not familiar with the V6 Community. So V6 Community, we're, this is a, an organization on GitHub consisting of a bunch of people that want to create tooling and better, yeah, better tooling for Visual Studio extensions. And uh, and so there's the toolkit belongs in here, and um, there's a bunch of stuff. documentation belongs in there. Documentation, that's the uh, V6 cookbook.com. This thing right here. Uh, so basically getting started. If you haven't checked this out, this is a great resource, uh, I think. Uh, but that all belongs to the V6 community organization here. Anyone is free to contribute, and a lot of people are, which is fantastic. And But of course, we need samples. 
right? And so that we have a, a repo for samples, and this repo is used on the do in the documentation. It's used uh, just in general for 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 reference, right? It's something you can point people to, uh, so people can learn and see how um, maybe to do certain things. And um, we got three projects up there. Uh, insert GUID is kind of the uh, writing your first extension. That's the uh, sort of the end-to-end the -end extension that does something simple. And then we have how to do options. We have how to do a tool window. And today we're going to add how to do a single file generator. So uh, let's see here. So for that, let's go in here. What also, do we have? We're looking for segues. Sean Wildermith was saying, so that would be. Uh -huh. Oh, we got Sean here today. Hello, Sean. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the project. I just cloned it down from GitHub or the Charlotte Solution. I got a bunch of projects, three projects. Let's create an, a new project. So we're going to go ahead and add a new project. And for this one, I'm going to grab V6 project with command. And uh, I'll. You'll see why in a moment. Let's call this single file generators. That's the name of the project. Single file net generator like this. All right, so now we have our package. So the first thing we want to do is that we want to create our generator class. Um, maybe actually let me demonstrate what uh, what uh, this is. What is a single file generator? And we actually, ha I have one um, in action right here. So here's my v6 manifest file, right? Whenever I make a change to that file, there's like a code behind right here. Let me zoom in a bit. There's a code behind. We know this from ASP.NET and WinForms and so on, where we have these nested files that happen. And whenever I change the parent file, these uh, subfiles are updated, right? That happens from a custom tool. So if I say F4 on my v6 manifest file, you see the custom tool here is set. There's a string in here, v6 manifest generator. So that's a type. That's something that's registered with Visual Studio. Visual Studio knows what where to find this custom tool and run it whenever uh, there, I save the uh, file up here. So let's let's here take an example. So the name of this extension is single file generator here without any spaces. Now let's go ahead and fix that up here. I'm going to add my spaces and just save that file. And now we can see that in the code behind. That was updated, right? So a single file generator is something that's capable of uh, automatically runs whenever the parent file is 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 saved to disk, and then it spits out a file and automatically nests it under uh, the parent file. So really useful for a lot of situations, right? You can kind of imagine there's, there's no end to the possibilities on this one. Uh, but you will see soon why this is one of my favorite things. So let's create a... Uh, let's create a class. So let's, uh, I want to like a, have a folder called generators. And then we're, in this in this case, I'm going to just do something simple. So I want to compile a SAS file. So SAS is this flavor of CSS, right, for web development. So what you do is that you have a SAS file, you compile it into CSS. So it's kind of a very, very simple example that's easy to reason about. So that's why I feel like that's a good example to, to use for this sort of stuff. So let's call it SAS uh, um, or CS, uh, SAS to CSS. That's a good, and it, it's a class. Okay, SAS to CSS. So in this class, what I want to do is I want to... Um, this is one of the rare occasions where we as extenders, we get base classes to use. Uh, and this is not a toolkit. This is not a toolkit class I'm going to use. It's in the Visual Studio SDK. And it's called base code generator with site. Boom, like that. We're going to implement this abstract class. Okay, so first of all, we're going to see what is the default extension, file extension, that we're going to produce. So whenever my file is being, what, whatever file has the custom tool registered to it, what is the file extension that it needs to produce? And in our case, we want to have it produce .css. Right? We're going to compile SAS into CSS. Okay. 
And then we're going to basically figure out how to convert our SAS into CSS and return a byte array. What's up, James? Were you about to say something? Oh, no. I was just unmuted. Oh, Sorry. okay. Whoops. No, it's okay. So in order to compile SAS, let's get a SAS. What's it called? Is it called SAS? Oh, what's it called? Hang on. Hang on a second. I know what it's called. I just need to find the name. Uh, SAS, sharp SCSS. Sharp SCSS. There it is. So let's grab that one. There we go. So now we got our SAS compiler. So now we should be able to do something uh, like, oh, hang on, something like this. Should be able to say, so I know how what this API is. I need to create an options, uh, new options class first, because I'm gonna use that. And then I can create some results. So now I'm gonna compile it. So I can just say SCSS, Convert file to CSS. All right. And look at here. It gives me the input file name. So we're just going to say input file name. And I'm going to give options. Actually, it looks like I don't have to give it options. Like options were actually optional. Huh? Um, let's nuke that. Input file name. All right. I can convert a whole file, but I could also do something else. I can, if I just convert the input string to convert to CSS, see, I got an input file content. So what I'm given automatically is a string representing the text buffer content of the file that's being saved. So doing this is like super clever, right? Because then I don't have to do any IO reading from disk or anything. So I could, I could just do it this way, actually. Uh, with, with SAS, for those of you who are web developers, you might know that we need to know what the file name is. So that one I did before was actually more accurate, but I think this might actually illustrate the use case better. Okay, so now I have some results. And so now all I have to do is encode, uh, let's do a UTF, get bytes off of the result. And is it result.css? Like this. Not get type, get bytes. There we go. And a control K E. The for me that runs my um, there. Check this out. Uh, configure. It runs all these uh, rules. Why does it run these? Did I sort? It needs to do all this sort of stuff. So whenever I hit control K E. It uh, basically runs the uh, code cleanup profile right there. Boom. Run on save. Oh, that's a new one. Hey, people, you're you're watching something in action here. This is a uh, this is coming soon, I guess. Cool. Does it does say int preview up top? Yeah, this is an internal preview. <laughs> but we have, I think, we have announced it on the developer community. Okay, so that's cool. So now it will just run on save. Let's uh, let's uh, see that in action. I'm gonna. Okay, I'm just gonna save the file now and then var should automatically turn to the full type. Save, boom, yes. Actually, so I have an extension. Do I have it installed? It's called basically code clean up on save. Let's see here. Go clean up on save. I have it installed, but now I can uninstall it. So why didn't it run before? Probably because that extension I have disabled for some reason. Uh, code cleanup on save, enable to, oh, it was running. Okay, well, 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 okay. Um, are there any questions, James, with this so far? It's a good question. Um, so Thindle says you change it to convert to CSS instead of convert file to CSS, but you're still passing in the file name. Yes, it has to be input file content. Good catch, whoever that was. Thindle. Thindle. Tyndale. Tyndale. Is it the Danish name? Tyndale. Um, yeah, please please uh, put in your phonetic. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> Florin also yeah. said it too, so I want to give some credit there. And also, oh, yeah. everybody basically caught you oh, on this. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, uh, isn't it wonderful that we have a live chat so that... Uh, 
my the way can be caught. The way he says it, the way you said it, Mads, was correct. Um, Super says, "Is this Sharp S CSS an alternative mm -hmm. to using external tooling Gulp to generate CSS from S CSS?" Oh, the way yeah. I said it, I said Thindle. Yeah, I said Tyndale. Tyndale. That's right. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. To answer the question from who was the who asked about the SAS CSS thing? Super. Super. All right. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So if you're using Gulp or Webpack or whatever it is you're using today to compile SAS into CSS. Uh, there's absolutely no reason to do that. If that's all you're using that Node.js tool chain for in order to write like a static website or an ASP.NET website. Uh, personally, I think there's better alternatives. One of them would be something like this, which totally exists. Like uh, if you go to the uh, here extension manager and search for SAS. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Oh my, hold on, stop, stop the press. Look at this. There's a brand new mode. I want to show everyone this really quick because I just, right. look at this. Picture in picture mode, Mads. <gasps> it happened. They did it. They did it. It happened. Streamyard. Thank you. <laughs> You're in the bottom left now. That's what you know. <laughs> wow. Okay. What about my name tag? Like right here. It's there. It's pretty yeah. small. Is it? I don't know. Yeah, it's still there. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> Sorry, I got real excited. <laughs> uh. No, I do have a... There is an extension out there. Uh, marketplace.visualstudio.com. If we go and search for SAS, and yeah, then we create say, one of these live one time already in some. Yeah. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. See yeah. here. Mm -hmm. SAS compiler. Boom. And see, it does the thing and the thing and the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, question here. Um, Daniel says, I wish we didn't have to register custom tools. It would be nice if we could simply set the custom tool property on any project item to a class within your project. This was early on. Okay, where where is that? Um, it was ten minutes ago. Remember where you were. Set the custom tool property on any project item to a class within your project. I'm not sure what what Daniel means with by this. Like, I agree, having to do it manually kind of sucks. But as you're going to find out a little bit later, is that we don't have to do it manually. Oh, nice. Da, cool. da, 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 da. <laughs> another, another reason why I like this a lot. Okay. So when we have our, um, our class here, like, this extension works fine. I can compile it, hopefully. Uh, and I can ship it, you know. But nothing happens because... Visual Studio, after you install this extension, is not aware that there's a class with this base class in there, and it doesn't know what to do with it. It's not even going to try. We have to register it first. So we have to make, we have to tell Visual Studio, hey, there's a class in here that uh, you're going to uh, want to use. And so in my package class, which I have right here, there it is. I'm going to now register. Uh, my code generator. So I'm going to provide code generator. See this? This is type of, uh, what did we call it? We call it SAS to CSS. SAS to CSS. And we need to give it a name and a description. Check this out. Uh, string name, string description. Okay. So let's, let's, I don't want to define that in here. I want to define that in my class here. So for that, Let's uh, do some constants here. So let's do a public const whoa, whoa, string name. And let's just be lazy and say name of SAS to CSS. It's like the user is not going to see this, I don't think. Um, well, maybe there's going to be some. We'll figure out where it's going to show up. I'm sure it, it might show up somewhere. But uh, so let's do another const string description. And say this transpi transpiles SAS on SCSS. They're both kind of flavors of, of SAS files to CSS. All right. Now I can go in here and say SAS to CSS dot name, SAS to CSS dot <gasps> description. And then, oh, where, did, where did you go? 
there it is. And then it needs a Boolean value, if I remember right. Generate the same time source. Yes, please. That's the whole point. Okay, and then should we register code base? Yes, we should. There it is. I could say project system and I could give it a GUIT. So I could limit this to only work in project system like C sharp or ASP.NET or something like that. But there's really no reason to in this case whatsoever. Now, the name of my custom tool is SAS to CSS. So let's just run this thing. Let's take a look. So let's create. Do we have a project? I think I have a. Here's a web project. Let's see if it works on that. This is a .NET Core project. Let's see how it works on .NET Core. I remember early on. I had to open a bug because custom tools didn't work on .NET Core projects. Uh, but I think they fixed it a long time ago. Let's take a look. I see there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on in the comments here. Yeah, Someone now it's just that. .NET. Just .NET. No more Core. Well, I guess it's an yeah. ASP.NET Core running on .NET. This could be .NET Core 3.1, by the way, right? Could be. So, it could be. I mean, you don't know from looking at it, do you? Yeah, this, well, this one is because this is using the new uh, the new builder model, the, the top-level statements. Uh -huh. So let's do SAS file. Style sheet. OK, so what is how do we do SAS? It's like color. Blue, right? So that's a variable, and I can use that by saying color and do color. Okay, so that's my SAS file. Let's uh, set my custom tool. Oh, I always want it to be out here. That's where it belongs. So custom tools should now be SAS to CSS. Let's see, does that even work? And right click and say run custom tool. Hmm. What's going on? Did, um, it didn't produce anything, and I don't see any errors. Well, that's bizarre. Is it not? Is it not fully? Uh, You know, it's always fun to troubleshoot extensions, but I do prefer when it just kind of works immediately out of the box. And I'll ask, is it a namespace question mark? Hmm. Like, I is there a custom tool namespace that needs to be put in there, I assume? Custom tool namespace? No. 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 Well, well. Uh, Sean recommends that you restart Visual Studio. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try the namespace. I don't think so. Yeah, that didn't that didn't do anything. So okay, so let's let's just uh close the solution. Do you want to save it? Sure. Sure thing. And uh, actually then let's uh, attach the debugger. I wish when I did extension development that I didn't have to go in here and find the process, just suggest the ones automatically that is dev and vexy, you know? And if there's only one other dev and vexy, then just assume that's the one I wanna connect to. Okay, so Package is loaded, so we can't really do anything there. Let's give it a go. Yeah, it's it's everything slows down when that debugger is attached here, but you know. Are there any questions uh, if we wait here? 
uh, while we were waiting? Yeah, Daniel uh, clarified a uh, question earlier. He said that he was meaning it would be nice if Visual Studio simply searches your project, including installed NuGet packages for the custom tool. Yeah, but how would it be able to apply it? Mm. You'll have Visual to specify. Yeah, you'd have to specify. I mean, at least it should tell me. So let me compile. It should say, can't find your custom tool. I don't understand why it's not saying that. Let's see if the error list says something. Mm, Jan had a yeah. suggestion. I have a different question for you. I'm going to put it up really quick. Ready for this? Yeah. Wait, should I watch? Should I see something? Yeah, you should see it. Question oh, by James. Yeah, I just need to get to the studio. There, there you go. Question by James. Ah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so it, it, well, so Jan says a question here, which was tip: instead of closing and restarting VS, you can edit the project file, unload it, reload it. You can also right-click and unload and reload. Is there a hotkey to unload and reload a project? No. But there could but, be if you run it. Um, yeah, you can run extension, but you could also like assign the keyboard shortcut yourself. Mm, there you go. Uh, all right. It's not currently it. Okay, so it feel like something wasn't copied over, right? Did you clean or, it? Or it? you know what? What if it's that? What if .NET Core three point one in this case doesn't know how to do? No, that would be insane if they don't know how to do custom tools. Like if they can't execute custom tools. No, well, why would they have a? Why would there be like a, a property item for it if they couldn't, right? That's just crazy. Debug in valid format. Oh wow, look at all this stuff. Okay. So let's do a clean. There we go. I have a clean thing that that nukes the. Uh, hey, you're not supposed to start. I just cleaned you. How can you just start up immediately? Okay. Oh, <laughs> because I just hit Control F5. I should set this as a startup project. Funny. So maybe that was the problem before. It actually launched the wrong. <laughs> that might totally be it. All right, let's try it. Mm, Trent says Control Shift W to close the solution and reopen it. Mm, all right. That could have been a total user error on my part that I didn't uh, start the right project up, but somehow I'm not sure if that matters. All right, all right. Then I did this right. Convert to SAS. Mm. It does register code base. Okay, here we go. Save the file. Come on, it's doing something. What you doing? Nothing. Nothing. This is bizarre, James. This is, when you think about it, this is a pretty bad sample. <laughs> is it hitting a breakpoint? Thindle says, yeah, at a breakpoint. Does it, does it, it does, work? Is it, it not doesn't. registering at anything? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. That is, is that is bizarre. Running? How do we even, how do we, how do we even debug into this? Sort of okay, let's just try to do a non.NET core, right? I just want to eliminate that possibility. So console app. Uh, but that should all be fine. You know what? I'm going to create a V6 project. A V6 project. They might become a, 
uh, SDK projects here in the future, but but they aren't yet. There you go. But I can't even add one. Okay. Then let me just add a class. Food uh, SAS. There we go. Then we can say custom tool SAS to CSS. And then I probably need to like color blue. Save that and nothing. So, okay, that, that makes me feel a little bit better. Why don't I get a colorization for this? All right, so here, I'm looking at this code here where I already have some stuff that I prepared that works. So my compiler, name of SAS transpiler, default is .css. Um, my package class, I provide code generator. True, true. This is absolutely bizarre to me. It's like it doesn't compile right. Okay, so let's take a look. What's inside our v6? Let's see here. Here it is. Single file generator. We got the toolkit. Sharp CSS. Yeah, we have everything we need and nothing else, it looks like. Oh, let's take a look at our package dev. I cannot open. Oh, why can you not open that? You go, while you debug that, good question from Paul. He just joined a little late. Can you explain what a single file generator is and why you would want one? You would want one if you want to translate a file to something else. So it could be like if you want, if you like to be able to uh, have a vector graphics in SVG format, for instance, but your code needs to be able to do a PNG, you can have that automatically translate into a PNG file but you can easily maintain it in, in the text file of just the um, um, of the SVG, right? So it's it, it, it's like translate from one format to another is, is a great example. Mm. Mark here says, one difference is that you supplied null for the SAS options. What is that? That's what Mark says. I don't know. I got to ask Mark. Mm. What is this? Look at this. I mean, it's the, we're registering, the generators here are being registered in our package dev file. So that all looks right. And I'm spelling it right. SAS to CSS name. Do you have uh, a breakpoint ever? Are you sure it's not? No, this time, this time. Findle, gonna... it, was, it says, add the breakpoint, Mads, do it. <laughs> do it. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I want StreamYard now to be able to let me move you to a different corner. That's my new thing that I want. But. Yeah, Mark Sweeney says I pr provided null for the SAS options. That's right. Yeah. Uh, because it, it was an optional, but mm. yeah, we'll see. Because it should uh, it should complain. Like I should get like the thing is that if if it doesn't run or can't find the tool, it should complain. Like I should see that in the error in the error window and uh, in the uh, sorry in the output window. So that's why I'm a little uh, confused by this. Um, so mm -hmm -hmm. it could also be that I, well, well, it leads me to believe that it can find the custom tool, but that it always produces null. So maybe that's what it is. And if it returns null, if it returns a null array, but then it would just return an empty array though, right? And that's a that's a thing. 
wouldn't that produce an empty file? I don't know. Uh, the default extension, this is a question from Yogesh. Uh, the default extension should be CSS. Because there's not the extension that is uh, from the parent file. It's the extension that it needs to produce on disk. Got it. So, so it's taking in a SAS file, putting out a CSS file. Mm -hmm. SAS to CSS. Ah. Oh. Unable to load DLL lip SAS. Oh, you know what this is? This is a really, really interesting and, and somewhat fun uh, issue because, oh dear, that's hilarious. So Lipsas, okay, here's a little explanation. Lipsas is a um, C++ or a native implementation of the, of the SAS compiler. And so, uh, but the thing is that it, I think that the code from the NuGet packs expect 32 bit or something like that. I need to figure out how to do, how to make it work for 64 bit. Right, so it supports, yeah, convert to CSS. So we need to uh, run time. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. So it, I need to put the, okay, okay. I see where this. So the single file generator, right? So the we need libsas to be included. How do I make see here? There where's libsas? There's no libsas DLL here. But it's included in the NuGet package. So the NuGet package is always under user profile and then dot nuget, right? Dot nuget packages. And then we call this sharp. Sharp CSS. It was 2.0, lip, this thing, this thing. And then you have, not, no, 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 not that, runtime, there we go. Yeah. Lip size deal, okay. So I need to make sure that that gets in there. So let's um, see if I can change, if that has something to do with how we are referencing that NuGet package. Sharp CSS version two. Okay, so let's just peek uh, into here and see what this says. Sharp, it just says sharp CSS. Shouldn't I say like include or yeah, uh, include, is it include assets? Well, excluded assets, in, exclude assets. So it'll be include assets, right? Include assets. One time. Does that look right? Reload all. I don't know. Let's take a look. Rebuild all failed. The type of names for sharp CSS could not be found. Oh, so that, so include assets. Oh, it should be all. I should say all, not just. Is it all or is it star, James? Um. Okay. Let me what, look. Include. What are my options here? Anyway. I think it's. Uh, I think it's all. Oh, private assets. All Trent says. Hmm. I never know those. Those always get me. Yeah. Right. Same here. Mm-hmm. Let's go look at the NuGet documentation. So the private assets all, that's correct. Then you have exclude assets. The default is none. And then private assets, the default is content files, analyzers, and build. So maybe runtimes is not a thing. Uh, Mustafa says there was a lib SAS entry in the other project, if I'm not wrong. I don't know how everyone saw it. You had it up for five seconds. Now, yeah. Also, someone else said that there was a uh, an entry in the other one. <laughs> oh God! So there is right there. So that's how we do it, everybody. Well, I think that it's more elegant if we can do it this way. But I don't know if that if it's actually working. 
No, same file size. Okay. So we have to do it that way. Well, today we learned, or I learned. Ready? Ready? I got one for you. Ready? Check your screen. Ready for it? Three. I got a good graphic for you. Okay, hang on, hang on. All right. <laughs> Man, you, you move fast, James. I'm quick. You are. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, in that a case, here's what we're going to do. We're gonna we're gonna create a uh, that was nougat. We're not gonna do nougat. Go away. Mm. John says it should be oh. private assets compile. Oh, well, wouldn't that be included in all? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe not. Oh. Uh, Rebuild. Trent, Trent says as content. I saw a manual reference to. Oh, that that was content previews. That's right. So that's good. Yeah. Or, oh, no, it's the same. No, still the same size. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go up here, samples. We're going to have to create a, I'm not going to do a lip folder. I'm just going to be, I'm basically going to go in and grab that. So we're going to do user profile. Get my new good package. I accidentally closed that window. So I'm just going to do that here. Sharp CSS, 2.0, run times. Win X64, and we always want to do X64 because. I'm out of here. Lip size to a little boom. And we're going to mark that as co copy to output. No. Including V6. True. Rebuild. Okay. So now, everybody, we should see. Oh. A bigger, whoa, 2,000. Yes, that's the one we need. Good. 2,000 gigabytes. Oh, my goodness. That's a big lib. <laughs> well, it's also uncompressed, right? So once, so when, when Visual Studio, when you run in debug mode, which I do now, right? Debug as my uh, configuration up here. It a, a V6 is not compressed at all. It's just put into a, a zip container, you know, with the .v6 extension, file extension, but it is uncompressed. When I run in release mode, it compresses it as hard as uh, whatever SIP mechanism that they use can do. So uh, we could see that we, I could try to see what the difference is. It's, I don't know how much it is here, but I, I think DLLs usually compress really well. Don't they? Actually, I can just right click this thing and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, man. That was a nice little gotcha there. <clears throat> yeah. So it takes a while when the debugger is loaded here. Yeah, manual reference to lips at the old Trent, your lifesaver. Thank you. Yeah. And Yancy says, at the end of the day, the fix included editing the project file. <laughs> is that like, is that is that fail? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe that is a fail. But to be fair, like how often do you use uh, native stuff in your in your V6s? Okay, I just saved the file. Uh, it comes in here. So now. Go. Will it produce the code behind file? Come on, come on. Oh, come on, debugger. Maybe I should have. Oh, I have enabled just my code. Hey, James, have you seen this? So when you're debugging on the debugging toolbar, I got this little thing here. Ooh, what's that? It toggles just my code. So mm -hmm. now it's toggled. It's on. But instead of going in through tools option every time you want to enable or disable just yeah. my code, just do it here. That's a uh, that new. That's Did not, you do that? Yeah, it's not built into VS. It's part of the extension called Tweaks. Ah, oh, classic. I do have that one. That's a good one. See, now oh. we have our foo.css file in here. And so, oh, did I actually name this SAS, but I should have named it SCSS. That's why I get no colorization for this. Uh. 
and then it runs again. It's okay. Let's see. Then I can do my color blue. Or, or people would do something like they would say, okay, this is a background color, something like this. Blue, and then you can then refer to that variable. There we go. And I save it. It hits our um, custom tool. And you can see it still says blue right here. Right? So that's pretty wonderful. And so if I do red, save, yes, then we can see it says red in our produced output here. Sweet. Whew. Well, that was good. So now the question becomes, well, how do you do this in a way that kind of, so I don't have to manually type in custom tools, right? Um, and there's a few things we can do. So let's say I always want this to happen on any file of a certain of a certain type of file, right? I always want this uh, to run. So what I can do is that I can move this over here so it looks like I uh, I'm, I just know this on top of my head. Um, but here is what I'll do. I'll go to my package class where I referenced the or registered the, the code generator. And then we can go in here again and say SAS to CSS. And now I can say provide code generator extension. Okay. So what I'm saying is provide the name. So first off, it needs the name of my custom tool. Oh, what happened? Oh, I deleted something. Oh, there we go. So it needs the name of my what? Go it. The hell's going on? Why is good no longer a thing with a the word? What did I do? Okay. I guess. And then we're gonna say what a file extension to use for this. And so we say the SCSS file. So now anytime I add to my project an SCSS file, it's gonna add the custom tool with this name. So there was a question about this earlier, if you could just do it like immediately. Um, let's hear. Oh, uh, Tyndale, Tyndale, I guess is Swedish. I'm guessing based on his, Based on one of his comments here. Nope. Norwegian. Oh, man. Oh, it is. Okay, sweet. Okay. So now we're just going to use that same project. There was a new uh, file name called foo1.css. Oh, I didn't add this to the project. Actually, so let's just nuke it. And then we're gonna add, oh, it's a V6 project. I don't have the the right, uh, so we're gonna use the web application. Yeah, yeah, saves it, that's fine. Oh, good question here. What happens if you have two registered generators and they each uh, trigger on others generated file files? Is there a max recursion depth? Um, I doubt that a, that a file, Produced by a single file generator would trigger another single file generator. I don't think that's the case. Mm. I got a question. Question by James. Um, what if there's multiple file source generators that are registered for like the SCSS? Would it just comma del or colon delimit those basically and do multiple generators on it? I think it you can only have one. I don't know. Mm. We could try. Abo would like to know if the hot reload button's going to change again. I don't know. I think Maybe James final. knows. No, I think this is the final version. I think number three. I think this is it. Why did... Yeah, Thindle was saying, what about SCSS to CSS to min CSS? Whew. To min CSS. Yes. We can do min CSS. 
I guess would you you would you would kind of toggle those on top of each other, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it does have the tool in here automatically. See here? It automatically generates it puts the SAS to CSS on there. But for some reason it doesn't um, run these automatically in this project type. So that's kind of weird. Oh. So yeah, save that. So that's how you can do that for everything. So we put that on there. And then we could also do like our own, uh, we can add like um, a command, right? So that's why I chose this thing that had a command. So in here, I could just say, okay, what? let's get the file. So my command execution class here, or my command handler, I can say, I want to have a command so you can right click and click on something that says compile or transpile SAS files, right? So we can say, um, file equals um, await vs solution. Sorry, get current. So, oh, how do I do this? Get active item. Oh. Here's my item and as physical file. Okay. And then I can say file dot. I'm just gonna try set attribute custom tool uh, SAS to CSS name. All right, so that's easy, right? And that's an a wait for that one. Here we go. Oh, not try. Is that a wait? Awaitable, yes, excellent. So that's a really simple way of, of doing uh, of doing that. And let's see here, we get something is so weird with my my VS. I often get no highlighting for XML. And then, if, but if I go in and say open with, and I just say the default, then it's there. It's kind of weird. So this one, I I want on an item node. Here an item node, right? And I want it in an existing group up here instead the open group. Oh, so in here. Menu parent. What's the icon? Let's do a SAS icon. Do we have one? SAS style sheet. Boom. And there is one. And then we're gonna call it transpile SAS. To CSS. All right, but then we want to make sure that it's only visible on SAS files, right? We don't want it so that when you right click a, a C sharp file or anything, that it's visible there. So we're going to go in here and give it a command flag for flag for uh, dynamic visibility. Boom. And then, and then, we go into our package class. We need to have a new GUID string, by the way. So let's do a new one for auto generation. Or for this is about whether or not it's visible. Um, let's do a new here, nine. Just creating a new symbol, and we're going to call this. This is not about auto loading. This is about uh, command visibility. I didn't spell that right, and I don't care. So now what I can do is that I can provide a custom rule. And this string is called, what did I call it? Command visibility string. Here we go. Command visibility. And we're going to say SCSS or SA or SAS. So in that case, if I'm going to support both, I should do it up here too, SAS. Okay, so there are two flavors of SAS, SCSS and SAS. ASS. Yeah. All right. And so the last thing is that, so what we're doing is that we're setting the dynamic visibility, which means that we are uh, allowing the command to be uh, programmatically hidden or shown. And then we're basically saying, here's the rule that we're going to apply 
but I need to set I need to hook that up so that this GUID that has this rule applies to the button that I have up here, the command. So in order for me to do that, I need to do visibility constraints. Oh, yeah. So visibility constraint. Visibility item, and we're gonna do the GUID is um No intelligence. How about that? And ID is my command. That's the command I have here for my button here. And the context is my command visibility. This thing. So now I'm basically hooking up the different parts. I'm saying, okay, for my command that has this GUID and ID, associate that with this command visibility GUID. And so that now follows the rules that I've applied here that says when the hierarchy is single selection name, so if I click a, highlight a single file, that's when it should kick in. And then I just need to make sure that my command is ready to take that into account. So I'm gonna just override um, when the initialization is completed. And from here, all we do is this command, Support false. There it is. It's kind of weird the way that it, this is, but um, that is funny enough how it works, theoretically. All right. Yeah, the XML files do feel weird. You know, there is a there is an ask for many years to be able to express this the VSCT file in C sharp, and I think that would be great. And it's actually something we as a community can do because you know what? We can use a single file generator to create the VSCT file based on that C-sharp file, for instance, if we wanted to, just saying. That way the, uh, the V6 compiler does not need to know about a new format because a VSCT file is being produced just like it is today for, so that's how that works. All right, so what else do we have here? Can we write a dialogue to edit the file? No, I don't know. Maybe maybe you're just talking internally here on the. Okay, what am I doing? Oh yeah, so right click. So if I right click my VSCT file, I don't see my command, right? So let's add, let's add the SAS file. So we're gonna call it foo.css. Oh, it's already there. See, transpile into CSS, it's already there. I haven't even added it to the project. There it is. So let's call it bar. I'm not rename it. I didn't rename. How weird is that? Okay, so but it and now I have the transpile into CSS, but I don't have that on any other file. See that? Or project or anything like that. It's only on SAS files. I should be able to do it on this one too. Now I get confused. That's okay. So transpile, and that sets the that sets the custom tool, right? It was already set in this case, but sweet. We did it, everybody. We did it. Thank you. Thank you for all your help. This was uh, this was really helpful. Oh, there was one more thing. We should we should run a minifier, right? Okay. So if you want to string these together, uh, the way I do it, I don't actually string them together as in multiple file generators. So what I would do is I would um, write in capital letters for some reason. I would grab the enoglify, which is the, the minifier. And then I would go in to my compiler here and then say, okay, let's do a minified result here. So oglyf oh, oglyfy 
uh, the CSS, and that's the result.css. There we go. And then that's the minified, boom, 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 code. And save, and we get the right types. There it is. So now it also minifies. So that was that was a long answer for saying uh, I wouldn't string together multiple. I would just do the different steps that I would need in one uh, single file generator. All right. Can you output both a full CSS and a minifile fi minified file like Web Compiler does? So two files. Yes, you can, but you have to do these subsequent files manually. So let's say that you wanted a CSS file and then you want a minified CSS file. So what you can do is that you have the file name so you know how to produce, you know, foo.min.css, let's say. Um, and you know what file to uh, make it dependent on, have it, you know, hook it under. So you could do something like, okay, this is just pseudocode. Like I'm just going to write something and we'll see if it, if it makes sense, right? So you could do something like... Um, um, uh, you would do, what would you do? You would say vs.solution, no, vs.document. Then you could say get, get document view. You're all async, get the DBI context. Yeah, let's just do the async. Get document view async. Uh, and you can give it a file name, input file name, input file name. Come on. Input file name. Let's oh, let's just run this. So we're gonna thread helper dot jtf run async. Bam 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 bam. There we go. Uh, okay, so I got my file. And this file is going to do what now? So I can say, okay, I got my <clears throat> document view. I'm just trying to think out loud here. How do I do the window frame? Uh, no, what is it that I want? I'm trying to think, what is it that I want to do? I need to get my... No, I need to get the uh, solution to get active item I mean the active item so that's this item I might also just be able to oh you know I could say something like this physical file from file let's see what else we got from hierarchy from yeah 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 from file so this input file name boom that's how I want to do it Okay, I got my file, so I can say file dot at nested file. Okay, so now I need a new file. So then I could say, so the min file that I create, so um, var, so so I create one on disk, right? So that means I have string. So I have a min file name or path or whatever. So that that would be my 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 absolute path on disk, which is somewhere in my project hierarchy, right next to this file. Then I would go in and say, um, I would have to add that to the project. So I would go in and say project dot, wait, 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 yes, dot solution dot get active project. There we go. Now we have my project, so I can say project. Is there an add file or something? Add existing file, and that's the min file name. Boom. Is that right? And then I can say that should return me. Min file here, and I should. Is that right? 
Am I doing this right? What is what type is this? Add existing file. Oh, files. Just file. Oh, it is file. Okay. So min file first or default, right? Whatever. It's a it's a collection. There we go. So you can totally do it on your own, right? It's not that bad. So um, at this point, the CSS file has already been produced. And now in here, you're going to create your uh, minified files. So we're, we, you can move this in here. <clears throat> so that's one way of doing it. I've done this in the past with Web Essentials back in the day. Uh, and it works absolutely just fine. Um, all right. What else? What do, you, what do you think, James? Do we have any? Uh... I got some good questions for you. I've been saving them. All right. Uh, All right. For a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's see over here really quick. So the first one I have up here is actually from Thindle, funnily enough. But, you know, you are debugging into the experimental, the EXP instance of VS. Uh, is there a reason that it has to close every time? Does Can it be reopened? Are there scenarios when it does stay open or no? Yeah. You know, I really want hot reload. Just because it's it's sometimes very expensive, right? As you can see here, to a, to to a F5 into the experimental instance, so um, hot reload would be very fantastic. There are, it might work for just some cases. I mean, it, it totally might work, but there's somewhere it wouldn't, unless we. It might require some big rearchitecture. But for instance, menu items. So for instance, when you when you Edit. Let's say I want to move um, my. I want to reparent my button or rename rename this. Right. It would be really cool if if I could just see it in the experimental lens. Oh, you just renamed it. There was a hot reload. But the thing is that that uh, the way that the menu system is created, it's very very expensive. It happens during. Uh, I believe it happens during when you call devnvexy slash update configuration, which happens automatically when you install. Uh, extensions or if, when you have an update for Visual Studio. And it doesn't run again. Like So so those are relatively static. So exactly how to do hot reload on those is um, not, I, I, you know, I wouldn't know if that would be possible. But okay, maybe maybe it doesn't work everywhere, but, um, but just in some places. So when I do have an update to my uh, command handler, right, here, like this code here, I can make a change here and hit hot reload and have that apply. Hmm. Um, that would be really, really fantastic. Yeah, that makes sense. And I don't know, hot reload. Do I have a hot reload? I used to have a hot reload button. Um, you did when you were debugging. Yeah, right. So let's let's actually do it. Yeah, you, could like, you could like change, a, put a string in there or something like that. Or change yeah. custom tool, right? Like that custom tool. Yeah, this name right here. Yeah. Or what am I doing here? This might now I don't know if this actually will work or if we throw an exception. <laughs> okay, We're about to find out. We're about to find out. Yeah, debugging in production. In this case, you really need two monitors. So you can have VS on one and VS on the other. Yeah, you're right. I used to always demo like the precursor of all this stuff was browser link where you had like, I don't know if you remember ASP.NET browser link, but you could also do all this sort of hot reload stuff. Mm. And I remember demoing this on stage and, you know, it was always problematic demoing something like that because you basically need like two monitors to properly do it. So I guess we can do something like this. Okay. So let's see if this works. How fantastic would that be? That would be a blog post. I feel like if that works, I'd have to write a blog post about it. And make a video. Like, this works. Yeah. Okay. So what was it I was going to do? No. Go back into your... There. Go home. Yeah. We wanted the command. There we go. Okay. So we're going to custom tool two. And then going to hot reload. 
this is a really bad example because I think I needed that other, I need that other uh, project type because I cannot add a SAS file to this. It, it doesn't give me the web templates. What if it's not a web template? What if I can just take any file and rename it? So what if I rename this to uh, something that doesn't trigger any of this stuff? Yeah, I want to change it. Come on. Did I click the button yet? <laughs> okay. Com exception. Cannot be on a on a separate thread for oh yeah, because we're actually yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna delete this again. And it just takes a long enough. So what ha what happened was I'm on a I'm on a background thread, right? Because I'm running on a separate thread and I'm uh calling add nested files. I'm basically calling into a UI threaded API. So the fix is this. Uh switch that would be the fix but we're just not gonna even worry about that com exception is still a thing yeah that's right you don't see it that much i don't feel like um but usually usually is it, it it's it's ugly because you, you see com and think oh my god this is horrible but then when you kind of figure oh it's like a, it's actually a threading exception like okay Uh, Daniel asks, side question here, are VS extensions built against the framework since that's what VS is built with? Yes. Visual Studio 2015, no, hang on. Visual Studio 2017 and 2019 are built against 4.7.2 and Visual Studio 2022 is built against 4.8. And so your extension should follow those things as well. James, if this is a hot reload, it's going to work. I don't know. I don't know, man. Do it. I have faith. <laughs> I, I I can almost guarantee you that no one has thought of this as a scenario that they prioritize at this point in time for hot reload. I think there are, there are other areas that are more important or more users of or whatever that this is not something they have prioritized. So if it works, it would be... Um, First of all, fantastic. But second of all, like just a side effect. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Let's do this. What is it I'm doing? Oh yeah, it was my it was the right click. It was the right click thing. So let's get rid of this. Uh, it has a custom tool. Let's get rid of that. There we go. Okay. Now I'm gonna hot reload it. Oh hang on. It now says custom tool two. So let's just say see, see that it, it does that. All right. It didn't do that? going on man oh it or, or is it just extremely slow wow it is this is like the worst demo <laughs> machine machine's doing a lot so I, I it's really it's getting really tired. Like it's, I can hear the fan just. Yeah, it's this custom tool too. It doesn't matter what it's used to say. We're not testing that it actually does anything. We're just testing whether or not we can hot reload that string uh, from one thing to another. I've already tried with, uh, with command names and that didn't work and I didn't expect it to. Here you go. That's loading. I'll bring up another question. 
Yeah. And Daniel, how do custom tools work if you have a build server? Do you have to install them on the server somewhere? Yeah, this is a, th no, it, 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 this is a design time thing only. So mm. this is a, this is a, just like it is for a WinForm designer, right? I, I don't know if anyone has ever asked for a, a CI time code behind mm. generation of like a WinForms class or WebForms or, or some of these other ones. Uh, I'm not saying it wouldn't be valuable. I'm just saying uh, I doubt that it would. I, there's a use case for that for some things, but I don't think file single file generators is it's definitely not that. Yeah, you're checking in this code into GitHub. This yes, you're checking in the you're checking in the resulting code. The generated code is checked in. That's Got right. It. Christians asks, can I define the generator in the same project so my teammates won't have to install a custom VizX on every installation? No. No. It's unfortunate. All right, SAS. What's going on here? I right click. I'm waiting for the context menu. Here we go. You know what? You know what? I'm an idiot. I'm an absolute idiot because oh, I can't believe. It. Of course, this doesn't work. Oh, because this is the name of the the property I'm setting. <laughs> what I should have done was this. Hi, come on. I just can't hit my keyboard anymore. There you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Can you do a hot reload on like control F5 or do you have to have the debugger attached? Um no, you can do it without. There's there's a in tools options, hot reload, there's a setting. Just type in hot. There you go. And then .NET and C++ on there. See that debugging, that one. See, enable hot reload when starting without debugging. <gasps> oh, why can't I disable those? Because you're running right now. No, I don't oh. know. I have no idea. I don't think that's the case. <laughs> that would be cool, but I don't think that's why I can't. OK, so maybe I didn't have to attach the debugger, which would have made this a hell of a lot faster. Or can you do a v6 install headless? Uh, Thindal asks. Um, yeah, you can. Um, it's not supported. It's using undocumented APIs, um, which personally I'm not afraid to use. Go look at my uh, extension manager extension. It's literally called extension manager, and it it um, it does that. So, um, yeah, they're, they're not documented and they're, you know, subject to change. It's like, there's no guarantee that the, that, that API is stable. It's been, it's been somewhat stable. There has been some updates to it here and there that might break you or that would break you. Um, but usually within the same major version, you're fine, but no guarantees. No, what you really want is that you want a, maybe an extension pack that you want everyone in your team to install. Or preferably when we get the VS config story finished with extension support, you can have a .vs config file. It's a JSON file in the root of your repo or next to your solution file that specify what solution to install. And then when you open that solution, VS will prompt you to install those. That'd be kind of cool. What else? Yeah, regarding the whole team install question. You can push it with a group policy. Yeah, that would be another good one. I, I feel like it's better if they just live in the repo um, because you can have like, you can, your team can work on multiple repos, right? It doesn't have to be, you don't need, if you only work on one of the repos, why mandate all those extensions if there's multiple, right? So that didn't. Yeah. Yowser, this is slow.
if this doesn't work now, then I'm like, okay, I'm just giving up. It, it doesn't, it doesn't even do anything. I, I, I don't know. I'm running out of, maybe because it realizes that this isn't set. Oh, this doesn't exist. Custom tool two doesn't, or CS, SAS to CSS two does not exist. Therefore, it kind of just rejects it. There's no errors from me doing that. Okay, well, we'll have to, we'll just have to um, investigate and, and see it for ourselves. So, um, all right. I think that's enough. That's enough of me goofing around uh, for today. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, do we have any last questions here, James? Mm. Max, have a good comment here. Really like the per repo plugins. Have you considered allowing V6 to be in a NuGet package that is restored when you open the solution? Uh, we did think about that. What was it? We even had prototypes on it. There was some like major issues. Well, one of the issues is that okay, you you clone a project, or you do like a you do a git pull or whatever to get the latest, and then all of a sudden Visual Studio asks you to restart, and that's kind of a sucky experience, right? You open a solution, boom, you want you to restart. <laughs> um, but no, hang on, hang on. That would be the same in the VS Config scenario. So what was the issue? The issue was what? Oh, Sayed, he did a prototype on this like eight years ago, something like something like that. Um, you know, I f I forget what it is. I forget what it was. Um, I I like I like the declarative where you just say, hey, what is the ID or the URL or something like that, and then Visual Studio fixes figures it out from that point of view. But installing a NuGet package into the solution, I don't know. If you if you install a NuGet package, like because you need some compile targets or something. Uh, well, then just use that. That's fine. But that's usually, usually you, then you don't need an extension if you do everything on compile time, let's say. Okay. How does this generator compare to source generators? Um, it's, it, they're very similar. They're very similar. Um, I think source generator, I don't know too much about it. We had this conversation, James, didn't we, at some point? Um, well, we talked about like how little we knew about source generators. <laughs> That's correct. I still know little. I feel like I need to learn more. Yeah. Maybe I go to .NET Conf and learn about source generators. Oh, yeah. .NET Conf .NET. Right. Okay. There's a off-topic Adorna question. Let's let's hear it. Uh, are you guaranteed to have them be applied from frame one and always trigger? Is that is that the Adorna question? Um. Are you guaranteed to have them be applied from frame one? Um, no, you're not guaranteed to have adorners on frame one because that would slow down the opening of files. So you would be a you would you would you can do it that way, but please don't ever ever uh, do long running operations on the UI thread. Opening a file, remember, it's a UI operation. Like you see the file, it's opening. It's literally being written. The text buffer is, is rendering on, on the screen, right? So you are bound to the UI thread. And if you do anything to slow that down because you be, want to be on frame one, you're not going to have a... I don't think you're going to have a successful extension. Uh, maybe people don't care and they say, oh, the value of what you're providing is higher than the perf impact... Um, it might have on them negatively. And so in that case, then you're good. But um, um, the, but so I think the samples for any any adornments, which is, so an, an adornment is basically a piece of custom WPF inside the editor. Uh, so, uh, so that's that. So the, the, all the, all the adorner samples, all, I think they all, to uh, switch to the background thread to do their stuff. Whenever that you have to render the WPF, that's always a UI operation because that's just how WPF is. It has to be on the UI thread. Uh, but everything that goes on before that to figure out where it's going to be, all that sort of stuff, you want to kick that off once the the file has been opened and you and you reach the first idle. Like it is really really soon, right? It's like milliseconds, depending on what type of file and language service involved and all that sort of stuff. But um, 
yeah, always always do that heavy lifting in the background so you don't interfere with uh, the file opening scenario. I would really, really like to have it though. I want to hide the information. Yeah, so you can. You want to hide information? You want to like, people open the file and it has like a certain something on it. You want to like put an adorner over it to hide information? I, that's, I've never thought of that use case. That's an interesting one. Oh, hiding config keys while streaming. Ooh. Now that's a good idea. That is a that is a great idea. So I would say for something like that, absolutely. Block the UI threat. Yep. Uh, that, that's a security thing, and you do it. So the thing, the good thing about extensions that are because they're not in the box, they're always like people voluntarily install them because they are interested in the features they bring. And this is one of those, hey, I value security or something like that higher than performance for presentation scenarios. Therefore, I'll, I'll take the hit gladly, the perf hit. So that's, what a brilliant use case. Love it. Um, what else? Okay. I think, uh, I think that concludes today's uh, episode. Any final words? The more you know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, James. And thank you, everybody. Uh, asking questions. It's, there's a lot of great questions today. And sorry that, uh, you know, I was like fumbling around there for a bit. Uh, I did ask you in the past whether or not you want me to be super well prepared so everything just works. Uh, or you like me to kind of debug things. And you all said that you uh, like me to kind of uh, debug and then we learn together how to debug things and find errors and, and you find value in that. So I hope that's still that's still true. And with that, I hope to see you next week. Have a great weekend. <laughs>